right guys it's me Carrie Silver Lining Mena and this is another one of those videos in which I already recorded once but decided to do it again the last one even though I want to share the same stories <clears throat> I feel like I spent too much time in the details and telling you the story of and then what happened and then this happened and then you know what happened next that kind of thing and and while they're interesting stories I want to just fast forward to the lesson at the end of them um, I was so down. Um, you guys saw that video, hopefully, or you, at least you saw that I posted it at the, in, in which I worked with Tracy Redding. And I was in such a rock bottom place that even, you know, I can turn on my shine when I need to, but it probably leaked through a little bit, my, my bad and, you know, sorrowful, hopeless disposition. So even though I'm kind of in the same place right now, I'm feeling a little bit better. You know, it takes some time to transmute stuff. So I'm, ho oh, because the reason I'm saying that is because immediately after I did my video with her, as long as I was all dolled up already, I went ahead and I did the video I'm going to do now. And I just, I didn't like how it was. So here I am for a do-over. I do that fairly often, but there's value in doing it the first time because number one, it gives me an opportunity to kind of, you know, edit out what I don't like in a way. It gives me an opportunity to add the things I forgot and it gives me perspective. It also just allows me to just emote. And that's what this is all about. So sometimes the shows don't make the cut and the stories change a little bit, but for the most part, it's, you know, it's just, it's all growth for me. In fact, I was so despondent in that last video that the one that I'm not publishing, I pretty much made an announcement that this might be the last episode of Silver Linings. And the reason that I did that, I mean, I've got, I gave a teary goodbye with the, um, the disc this what do you call it not a disclosure i don't know a, a dis something maybe disclosure i can't remember the word right now you know how i do that but anyway saying that you know i may or may not come back but but i'm at least going to take a break i was feeling so overwhelmed with my life number one i just felt like that i had to give all my focus and all my attention to my family and doing these videos takes a lot of time and i just i don't have i went through like a while where i didn't even know when the last time i brushed my teeth was i was like that overwhelmed with life that creating a video like this felt like a luxury so um so one of the reasons though, besides that, that I wanted to shut it down, so much has gone on. I, I wait too long for these videos, but sometimes I just can't help it. In fact, I need to tack a little note onto myself. I don't really, it'll come to me because a lot of my stories have to do with a reading that I recently had. I didn't plan on this reading. Um, it just, it the opportunity was, was gifted to me. Heather wanted to use me as a guinea pig to kind of practice because she wanted to get back into readings a little bit and it couldn't have come at a better time. Because as you know, my daughter's really struggling with, um, well, she's been diagnosed, I believe, with anorexia. I mean, it looks like anorexia to me. There may be some little claws or whatever, but this girl is so fucking skinny. I, it's a constant struggle to get her to eat. And so it's not just her struggling, you know, it's the whole family has to deal with it. And, um, and you know, we're glad to. We love her and we support her, but we all are suffering right along with her. And that's kind of where I was in my hole before, suffer, suffer, suffer. So I'm on my path to trying to find the silver linings. And, you know, it's like, how do you find the joy and pain? And I kind of had to give, I, I answered my own question with that because I think I've given you this analogy before, but sometimes when you like, say you burn yourself, well, when that burn starts to heal and scab over, it still hurts, but it's healing. So I guess I can't, well, I can't even say that I get joy from pain, but I can have an appreciation for it and a gratitude for it because that means that whatever was hurting me before, I'm healing from. So um, I got to keep referring to my phone because I forget. So another reason that I wanted to kind of end silver linings was because, you know, that that very simple yet wise um, phrase that says when one door closes, another door opens. And I really just wanted to close the door on the twins because even though I keep claiming that, you know, I've healed from my past through them, which I have, I've, I've healed all those past traumas, but I keep saying that, you know, I know that shit's on, I know that shit's on. And when I spoke to Eric through Heather, I tried to get a little bit of, you know, input about them. And Eric's response was, fuck them, fuck them. And he, tr he tried to tell me that, you know, both like romantic aspects of those relationships are off the table. I don't really believe him. I mean, maybe, 
maybe it's true. You know, he told me that fairy boy's higher self decided that it wasn't in his best interest and his soul's evolution to reconnect with me, but we still might see each other at some event later on. Something I've been told for many years. So every time I'd go to like any kind of event, whether it was just an informal party at Elise's or my Stardust events, all of this stuff for years, I've been looking for the, my first boyfriend is what I would call him. But, um, but still that still hasn't happened that, that, um, that event. And that, that if it does, it does. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I still would like to reconnect with him, but, um, and Michael, I know I will re reconnect. There's just no way I won't, but in what context, I don't know. And, um, and I realized that the, if I keep thinking like this and I keep sharing about it on this show, about how this connection that I'm just feeding that energy and by feeding that energy, I'm not letting go of it. And I want to close that door. I mean, how many times have I said, I just want to be free of it. I want to be free of it. Well, in my mind, you know, well, according to the guides, according to the internet is that in order to be free of them, I got to fuck them. That's just part of it. So I've been motivated for that. I do want that experience, but for reals, there's got to be somebody out there that will provide me with the sex I crave that comes with a more constant love, not just you know, five minutes worth, because that's what I've already experienced with both. And I didn't even get the union. So I don't have a lot of expectations for these relationships being um, especially satisfying. And it's no reflection on them. It's just what twin flame bullshit is about, at least for me. So when he's saying, fuck them, I'm like, okay, yeah, right. Like, I believe you. I still believe it that that shit's going to happen. I don't know if I'm like fooling myself or if I just really know. But that message that he gave me really kind of hit home. And so I wanted to close that door. I want to be free, but I don't want to feed it anymore. I want a new door open. But, um, but I do still like learn and grow through them. And one of the things that I realized I'm in this really big place, as you know, I've been making posts on in my group and, and I've said, you know, I've been saying it for a, you know, a good year through here that, um, that, you know, I just, I'm not comfortable with my body yet. I still have the body dysmorphic disorder and it really does play havoc on you. And, you know, pe people commented on a recent post that I'm beautiful, I'm beautiful. And, and I thank, I thank you. I thank them for that. And I know I'll take a nice picture. I say this all the time, but you know, you go to the waist down. That's my ugly part. That's my ugly part. I can do okay up here, but it doesn't matter because I'm attached to the rest of it. So just because I have a pretty face, Ooh, great hair like my new cut by the way just because I have great hair and a, and a pretty nice face doesn't mean I feel beautiful because I feel really ugly still and I know it's that beast of the body dysmorphic disorder it's the dialogue in my brain and I'm working so hard to rewire that so I'll um I'll move on. I'll move over to that a little bit more. I want to talk about that a little bit, but, um, but I see that I'm still viewing myself through their eyes and not that, you know, not really though. It's the perspective that I hold. Cause I don't even think they bother looking at me. And by they, I mean the twins. Let's be clear about that. Uh Oh, I got a pop up. Okay. So, um, so, uh, so, I, I, I decided to create a little joy for myself and I'm like, you know what, I cannot, I cannot be a good role model to my daughter who is suffering from anorexia and body dysmorphic disorder if I'm still like hating on myself. So I have just got to do it. If not for me, then for her, but I have to do it for me and then it will trickle on down to her. I get that. So, you know, I take active strides to change this. So I was like, I'm going to go to the mall and I'm going to find me a shirt that I feel good in. And because I don't have to be naked for anybody, I don't have to, you know, like some people, you know, they'll do, I'm really inspired by before and after photos when, you know, bodies and getting in shape and stuff. Although now I'm, you know, critical in my own mind about how you go about that because I don't want to just diet. I don't want hardcore shit. I want to do it the right way. And I've also come to realize that, that I will just never be able to get to a place of body comfort until I get comfortable in my head because even at my smallest size I was still tr striving towards something else so weight loss isn't even a goal right now I don't even want to think about it so I tried to find something that I could be pretty in in the size I'm at now well I went to the mall and I went to all kinds of stores and I didn't even find very many things to try on I tried on a few things and every I was so disillusioned I just hated everything um so when I'm standing there in the mirror with this one shirt I finally found and it was on sale for like 50% off and it still ended up being 30 something dollars. I mean, what the fuck? This is just some funky ass shirt 
with this crazy pattern with these bright colored flowers. It's kind of grandma, but it, the cut fit me okay. Um, and I was thinking, okay, well, I could never, I would not feel comfortable on like a date with Michael or Fairy Boy wearing this. And I was like, well, would I feel comfortable with, with the mystery man that in theory is going to show up in my life one day? And I kind of did. So even though I'm still trying to view myself through somebody else's eyes, it's just some generic person. So I'm not sure that mattered so much. But when I cling to these other two, I'm still like keeping myself trapped in a place of needing to be to look like the the bodies that <clears throat> sorry i was chosen over for so sorry i have to have a little cough <clears throat> so i think that was eric's motivation to tell me you know fuck them was to get me to move on from that because i'm still creating this place uh, so i don't know because you know i really enjoyed my fantasies about with them it's like my escape my life is so fucked up and challenging right now that i welcomed that fantasy even though i knew it was a fantasy i didn't care i needed a little bit of you know pleasure in my life even though it was just a fantasy um so i had i wanted to to mention that you know oh but see what was happening was that they're getting farther and farther away from me i can't even access them in my fantasies and this has happened for a while if they come in and out i guess it just depends on where i'm at in my transmutation cycle but i haven't been able to find them in so long and i'm not even interested in looking at their pictures i just i don't i, I can't i don't know what the block is so it's like i want to have these fantasies but i can't access them and i don't even it's not that I can't open my phone and look at a picture. I can, but I just don't. I don't know why. It just feels like the past, I guess. So one day, and I have to tell this funny story. And, you know, I have I have like, sometimes I think that these men are going to watch these videos one day because they're going to fall so in love with me that they'll need to learn everything about me and become obsessed like about me like I was about them. So, you know, sometimes I try to mind my words and keep that in mind. Um, so in case that would ever happen, I'm a little bit embarrassed about that, but I'm in such a place about what I'm about to say, but I'm in such a place where I don't give a fuck or I don't even think that they're going to come around, but I wanted to share this dream because it's so funny to me, but I was like, <clears throat> because I couldn't find them in my fantasies. I'd be like, please let me have a dream. I want to, I want to love dream. I want to escape my reality. So please bring me a twin dream. I don't care which one it's about. And I don't care about the context. I just want to connect with one of my twins in a dream. So fairy girl, she's so fucked up. She's so fucking funny. I only remember a very quick flash of my dream. <laughs> and that was, I had a dick in my throat and I was given one of them, one of my legendary blowjobs. I don't know which one it was, but I had to laugh so hard at her for just, you know, and I'm like, I don't care what it is. I don't care who it is. I never got to find out what it was, but at least it was something I enjoyed. I crave that. Are you guys like that? Do you, I like crave that. Boy, I hope I get an opportunity one day to participate in fellatio again. Mm. Okay, so, and then, you know, I always say I never have dreams. Well, all of a sudden, I'm being flooded with dreams. I had another dream that I was making out with some girl. I had another dream. Ooh. Okay, I had a dream about, remember, I've, I have this, like, history of being second best secret. Well, the boy that created that first experience for me back when I was, well, I keep saying I was 12 years old. I was a little bit older than that. Maybe I was 13 going on 14 or something like that. And, you know, we didn't have sex or anything, but there was a little bit of petting going on. And shh, don't tell anyone. Well, I had a dream about him. And then, not too long after that, he liked one of my pictures, a memory of mine. But you know what's interesting about that? Is that memory did not include me. It included my three kids. We were on a vacation with my friend Jerry, the one I've mentioned many times, my funny, funny friend, who is very tall, very thin, and very blonde. So if that wasn't like a nudge from the universe to remind me that this dude pissed me off and and um, chose me over the tall, thin blondes, you know, I don't know what it was. You know, I see the patterns. I know that I'm being nudged towards something. Oh, okay, that's another thing. I don't want to forget this one too. Oh, okay, I'm going to write it down because I don't... So, um, so that was another dream dream. And I don't even remember what the context of that dream was. Um, and another dream I had, and I won't go through the whole details, but it was, it was a dream about Michael. And for the first time ever, I dreamed about my family and Michael was coming out of one room and he was talking to my dad, have a, having a conversation with my dad. That was interesting to me. That's the word I just wrote down dad, because I have some sto a story to tell about him. 
And um, I'm talking so fast because I got so much to get out and I haven't even barely scratched the surface. I'm still in the damn twins that I thought I was done with. Okay, so then my dad left and I'm in the hallway with Michael and I'm hugging him. We're just hugging, standing there. And I was saying, is this real? Is this real? Is this real? And I couldn't see him because I'm in a hug, but you know, I can get the vibe that he's smiling. You know, it makes him happy that I'm like, wow, is this real? And then cut the dream went to me sitting on the floor and he's sitting on the couch and I've kind of got my my arms on his legs and he's sitting next to Layla talking to Layla and um and then I said okay well you know you all this stuff about my and my husband and my other sons were at this place too it was Carrie Walker's house although not her house so I said well enough talking about me and my family how are you know how's your baby and he goes no I'm not going to talk about that because of all the bullying he got online and that was kind of funny because it's an infant an infant is you know infants don't get bullied they don't have accounts yet but in retrospect I wonder because he was talking to Layla if it had anything to do with Layla's bullying and you know I already learned that you know, we're all connected on the other side. So in some way, um, you know, since I'm so connected to his baby, maybe he has some connection to Layla. Maybe he was, you know, talking to her and I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm grasping at straws. It's just interesting to me. I'm not like putting any real stock in it, but the next part of the dream was interesting because then we cut and we're outside, you know, cut to the next scene and we're outside and we're not in Houston, Texas, like Carrie Walker lives. We're out someplace where we have this magnificent view of a, of a valley that just goes and goes and goes. And from wherever we're at, we're outside, or I'm outside with some people. Michael is still in the house. And there's a driveway. And the driveway, though, has like graduated steps that are like this steep instead of being like a smooth, you know, um, slope. It has steps that are this big. So a, a tire can clearly ride over it, but there was like a burst pipe or something and tons of water was just gushing down onto this driveway. And I remember that on not only that, I was barefoot. I'm often barefoot. I didn't even have a sock on this time, but the driveway is all wet. And in that water on the cement is covered with bugs I don't know if they were spiders or caterpillars or what they were but they were creepy crawlies and I remember thinking the only way I can get back to Michael is to go through the muck and I remember even in my dream that was symbolic to me the only way to get back to Michael is to go through the muck there's no other way around it you have to go through it so that was interesting to me too and then I woke up and then I was tripping out that I had yet another dream about Michael. So I fell back asleep and that dream continued. It was completely different. Michael was avoiding me by being nice to everybody else. And we were at this outdoor water park that really wasn't an official water park. It was an old fashioned, like from 150 years ago, um, amusement park. And all the rides were like, you know, like if you want to picture like steampunk, it kind of old fashion like that so the people of this community community made it an unofficial water park ride very dangerous anyway that's what was going on with that strange to me that I dreamed about my family for the first time I dreamed about Michael again had that you know kind of profound bug incident and then I went back to the dream I know people do that but I usually don't so that was kind of significant to me <coughs> I also realized that, you know, I remember how he would say all the time that I would <clears throat> always write Michael those really juicy love letters. They were so pornographic, I guess. Um, and while I was truly like emoting my desires, I did want to do all those things to him at one point um, with him, to him, whatever. Um, and they were also filled with love. But I realized that what I was doing was creating circumstances for me to feel shame so I can process that shame because I would I mean he didn't know what to say to them he didn't want to encourage me so he'd just read them and not say anything and it would embarrass me it humiliate me and now I understand the reason why I had to recreate shame about you know sex I didn't have to do it I just had to write letters about it and that was enough for me to create the shame I needed somebody to receive my words and then ignore me for it so thanks Michael Thanks for ignoring me so I can create shame and humiliation, but for real, because I did process it and move through it. And, um, and I mentioned, um, you know, the whole thing about Layla and I have been so immersed in trying to help her and, you know, give her positive self-talk to use on herself that 
it's starting to wear off on me because, and that was one of the reasons I went out and looked for the shirt. It didn't really work that well, but I tried, you know, I'm, I'm really trying to just normalize myself. And I've um, been posting about articles I've seen, and I watched this movie on Netflix called Awake, in which everybody, like, there was some EMP or something, or solar flares, I don't know what it was, but most of humanity, except for two people, apparently, they couldn't sleep anymore. And you know what happens when you don't sleep, you just, you know, you get you get nuts. And so these people kind of turn into jomelies. I mean, sorry, that's how Layla used to say it, zombies. They used to turn into zombies. They turned into zombies in a way. They weren't real zombies. They were just so tired that they would lose their mental capacity to think rationally. So um, so there was this one scene where a group of people, I don't know how many, 20, this car came up on this group of people that were just all staring up at the sun like zombies. But the interesting thing about this, the way this affected me was that all of these people, they were naked. And they were just regular slice of life people, old people, young people. There weren't any kids, I don't think. Maybe there were, but I don't think so. Fat people, skinny people, you know, um, soggy people, <laughs> wrinkly people. These were just regular bodies, regular. There wasn't like one supermodel in the bunch because supermodels aren't regular people. They're super for a reason. <laughs> and not only that, you know, none of these people are airbrushed. So I'm looking at that and I'm like, I could fit right in there. I could be one of these people. I could be one of these zombies staring into the sun and nobody would go, oh my gosh, look at that one right there. She's hideous because I was just as regular as all of the rest of the people. So I'm really trying to reprogram, reprogram myself. I'm a regular person. I'm a regular person. I'm a regular person. I don't need to find my body beautiful. My body's not beautiful. In fact, I started to say, you know, I have a lot of, I get inspiration from the before and after of people. I personally don't ever feel the need to put my, my before or after on, you know, on the internet for people to see because it's nobody's fucking business what my body looks like but me. I don't need to be accountable to anybody else. I only need to be accountable to me. So while I do find inspiration in it, it's nothing that I would ever choose to do because it's my business. It's not your business. I'll get there on my own. I don't even need to feel either, you know, like I better get with the program or I'm going to be ashamed. People are going to mock me, you know, which is what I would feel probably, or just... I don't know. It just doesn't interest me personally to each his own, but it's not my thing. Um, so anyway, I'm really, uh, so my, J Layla's journey and me trying to guide her is like seeping into my own awareness. So she's going to help me learn to accept myself without judgment because I want it so bad for her. And I see how ridiculous she is judging herself, how distorted her thinking is. And I can sit there and tell myself all day, yeah, but she's skinny and I'm fat and fat's bad. I, I got to stop doing that. And and Eric also told me that I'm still judging food. I, you know, I thought I had released all that. And while I made peace with my forbidden foods to an extent, I don't need to like have those marathon binges where I make myself sick anymore. I haven't made peace because I'm almost like, I won't say gleeful, but it makes me, it gives me a sense of like being happy when I feel hungry. I'm a good girl because there's no food in there because I didn't eat. And then I feel slightly guilty when I'm full. And why? I mean, I don't mean like throwing up full. I mean, just like satisfied full. But that's what we're supposed to feel. We're supposed to feel a little bit of hungry, then we feed, then we feel satisfied. And, you know, we're quote full. Uh, why is one good and one bad? It's just... They, they just should just be. It's like, I don't get mad at myself for being dirty or proud of myself for being clean. I'm just one day I'm one and one day I'm the next. It doesn't matter. But I'm, I get, I judge myself on whether or not I'm hungry or full and I still find myself judging food. I learned that, you know, oats are really good for people with PCOS. So I bought some plain Cheerios, but I have such a mindset of carbohydrates being bad that when I eat this simple bowl of Cheerios with some milk in it, I'm bad, bad. And I'm like, what the fuck? You've got to stop judging. And it's such an unconscious, subconscious thought. So as I eat this stuff, I really rewire and make it like neutral. This, These are Cheerios. They're made with oats. Um, they help the body process whatever, metabolize your shit, whatever. They help prevent insulin, insulin spikes. So I'm just trying to be factual and take a judgment out of it. And and I'm not necessarily trying to convince myself of this, but if I, I feel like if I say it enough times, it will become the truth. Like, you know, you can't do like three sit-ups and have, you know, abs of steel. You have to do lots and lots of sit-ups to create that muscle. So I'm building my brain muscles, I guess, in a way. Can't do it with one thought. You have to continuously doing it. So it is a process. 
Okay, so I'm also, not only am I helping my daughter with the inner work, which is, you know, it, it's so heartbreaking. And I've, oh, there's, and I'm like, I'm also helping my husband because remember, I'm his mirror and he is, he's, he's such a fucking challenge. Although there, I see a dim light at the end of his tunnel. And that's, those are the stories that I, like, I feel like I spent too long on last time. So, well, you know what, before I do that, I want to talk about my dad real quick and get that out of the way. But my dad is having such a hard time trying to figure out um, what is going on with Layla, you know, why, what triggered her, what happened and why, you know, you, he tells me in a text, in a text, cause I don't like talking on the phone. He just knows he's better off communicating through text. You chose to deal with this all on your own. Why? So for what, I can't even remember the context of that and the rest of that sentence, but it had something to do with her, but it doesn't matter. Cause I said to him, I go, well, it's not that I chose to do it on my own. It's that I didn't have a parent to guide me and see that I was fucked up. I didn't have a parent to guide me and say, you don't have to be that way. In fact, and I don't know if you remember this from last summer, but I told that I shared the story about how he suggested I go work at those taxi dancer clubs where the men pay you to dance with them and you know they'll come and rub their dicks all over you and solicit you you want to go back to my car to make a quick 300 bucks I never went to these clubs but I had a friend that did end up going to these places and she keeps popping up in my awareness out of nowhere after years and I knew it was some kind of nudge but I wasn't sure what the nudge was well, I told my dad, you know, last year about this and it just went like in one ear and out the other or I, whatever, cause he was reading it. So this time again, I'm, I'm reminding him that, and he's like, I don't remember any of that. I would never put you in harm's way. And I go, and I go, yes, you, I go, I know that. And, and you know, you're the one that told me about these clubs because you were always looking in the want ads for jobs for yourself. My dad has a chronic history of not maintaining a job he really did his best but he just and he don't he'd always have employment but he there were many different employments so he was always looking for a new job so he's the one that told me about it and so when he's like I'd never do that to you and I'm like I'm well you did but in my brain I honestly believe that you just thought that it was like disco dancing and men would like you know throw money at me in a cage or whatever and you know I like to go out dancing with my friends so he's probably thinking if she's going to go out and dance she may as well get paid for it but that wasn't the case and he didn't realize that so he was like in um he, again he didn't remember it and I let that go and, and I was like we talked about this a year ago and then he also suggested a year ago, if you remember this, that I make nice with my mom so that I can get back in her good graces so that I can inherit whatever fortune she's got. I have a half brother that for, I don't even know if he's like, she'd always use that against us. I'm writing you in the will, out of the will, in the will, out of the will. I mean, it was at her will all the time. She'd use that. And, you know, I just don't give a fuck enough about that money. It's not that much. I mean, you know, it's a nice chunk of change, but at the same time, it's not like it's $10 million. And even if it were $10 million, I'm not interested because to me, that's like in a way prostituting myself. So my dad suggested a year ago and I said, no, I'm not doing that. I worked really hard to shed myself of the bullshit that my mom dumped on me. There's no way I'm going to do whatever it takes to get into her good graces. So he said this to me again recently. And this time I really let him have it. No, I let him have it in, in a text. And I've been wondering this whole time, am I going to have to talk to my dad about this? Can, can I just heal? Can't I just see it for what it is and let it go? Because I don't want to fight with him. He is a good man. And I understand he was just providing triggers for me. But I see that I do need to say my piece. So I did say my piece and I, I ripped into him. And, and I was like, you know, you always have a million dollar idea for somebody else. If you like this one so much, then you go do it. You go get in her good graces and get the money for my kids because I'm not interested. How dare you suggest that I compromise myself? I'm not going to prostitute my body and I'm not going to prostitute my soul. Fuck that. So he apologized. I don't think, you know, he doesn't understand the spiritual parts of it and the triggers and stuff like that. But I'll explain it to him one day. But I needed to get that off my chest, which leads, I'm glad I did that little story because the, this, which leads to the next bit about my husband and the crazy shit that's been going on here. So weird. Okay. So I've mentioned before that it's like my current goal to learn how to calm the fuck down. So whenever we've gotten into these conflicts, these arguments or whatever, I've done all I can to just stay calm, stay calm. And it's hard. He's coming at me and he's accusing me of shit I didn't do. And I, I try so hard to explain it. That's not what I mean. That's not what I'm doing. You're misinterpreting it. I might have to give a couple examples just 
to get it off my chest and to explain what I mean. But one day I'm trying so hard to be calm. This is about three weeks ago. I don't know. But, you know, I wasn't allowing my buttons to get pushed. I kept coming down and doing everything I could because I want so much to not lose my shit anymore. Well, then he pulled like the biggest card he could and he had the fucking nerve to blame me for my daughter's eating disorder. And I just fucking lost my shit. And I went through one of those things that I call my exorcisms. I fucking let loose. I pounded on walls. I bruised myself. I had bloody knuckles. I screamed myself hoarse. I raged like I hadn't raged in a long time. And, um... And I was so angry and so livid beyond anything that later on I was like, you know what? I think that that was one of those exorcisms. I think me trying to be quiet, you know, that's not how I heal from that. I always release in, when you use your anger to free yourself and say, I'm not going to take that shit anymore, then it serves you. But, you know, to use your anger to, for revenge or whatever. In fact, that's what my dad said. He goes, you know, that's the best revenge, getting her money. And I'm like, that's not the best revenge. <laughs> I don't want revenge. I don't, you know, I'm not interested in revenge. I'm interested in peace. So, you know, you if you use your anger to benefit you and help you become a better version of yourself, then by all means, it means you're not taking that shit anymore. So I wasn't taking that shit anymore. So I thought I was done with being blamed, but I was wrong. Um, we went on and I remember I made that post about, and I did that big healing because the summer solstice kicked my fucking ass. Well, you know, that's on the 20th to the 21st. My husband's birthday is on June 20th and it was father's day. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to create my own reality, which is why I went to, you know, Louisiana, um, with my, my twins and okay, let me derail just for a sec. I had like a lot of little bullshit things happen along the way. I told you I crashed my brand new car into a pole. Well, before that I hit some debris in the road, which knocked something loose underneath. And, and then there was just all these little, little things. We finally made it to the nature park, but Ryan kicks a twig and gets a big ass splinter in his toe and it's bleeding everywhere. And then I step in a pile of dog shit in my new shoe. There was just one fucking thing after another. And I'm like, what the fuck universe? Why are you, why are you dumping this shit on me? Cause I'm always trying to, you know, I'm always saying, don't waste your opportunities to growth. Don't squander your challenges. I decided that that was just a way for me to not sweat the small stuff and try to go more with the flow, which is what I tried to do on this trip to the beach for my husband's birthday. And I had a few instances. I forgot my shade tent and it pissed me off and it pissed me off and it pissed me off. I'm like, this is such small potatoes. This is your opportunity to let it go. Anyway, it ended up being overcast and we didn't need our shade. So there you have it. Okay. So <clears throat> my husband, we had like two conflicts in a restaurant. Um, we were having a great day, a great day in this RV. And, um, and at the restaurant, he just, he just pissed my daughter off and I kind of, <clears throat> I kind of took up for her because number one, well, I guess I'll just, I'll give the short version of the story. We were snacking all day in that RV, having a good time with a bunch of snacks. I mean, I like had like dried salami and crackers and dips and chips and big bowls of fruit and, you know, like a party. We had a party. We had so much food and Layla's, you know, she's picking at it all day and she probably didn't have, you know, near what the rest of us had but by her current standards she ate quite a bit so we're at this restaurant and, she, and we're trying to get her to eat and I'm like "Is one little piece of chicken come on how about a grilled onion because we had fajitas and she wouldn't budge she wasn't going to eat anything and she's like I ate so much today please don't make me eat more and I, and I said well she did kind of eat a lot but I'm still sitting there trying to get her to eat chicken and my husband glared at me and he's like he just, he couldn't believe that I would try to sabotage him. I'm like, I'm not trying to sabotage you. I'm just, I'm trying to honor her truth because remember as a girl, I wasn't allowed to speak. Nobody heard me. So I wanted to honor that, you know, I hear you, you did eat. That doesn't mean you don't need to eat again, but you did eat a lot and I'm listening to you. I'm not going to be dad saying, no, you didn't. No, you did it. When in fact she did. Not only that, so I was trying to make her feel better by saying, I hear you. And I was always trying to make him feel better because we check in with each other. Did she eat today? Yes, she did. No, she didn't. So this is me trying to provide him with some comfort. But he didn't take it that way because his brain's so fucked up that in his brain, he's thinking, I'm trying to get on her good side. And I'm like, I don't care about being on her good side. I care about her eating. Besides that, I'm already on her good side. You're the one that's not on the good side. So why don't you shut up and listen to her? And he had pissed her off earlier in that same restaurant 
and this had to do with we had a we had a transgender waitress and she was very lovely she was very sweet but my husband said something kind of insensitive and he tried to just pawn it off as this that or the other and she's like you can't no that's not how that stuff works and he tried to just really lay it on thick well I was born in a different generation and you just need to respect my opinion it goes both ways and we're both like no we don't need to respect your opinion your opinion is old-fashioned and bottom line I mean he wasn't necessarily discriminating but it's like but I'm using that as an example there's no opinion that I will ever value that says that discrimination is okay it's like you know trying to argue that well I live in the south and and you know I like slavery it still works for me you must you must respect my opinion and it's like no nobody in today's day and age will respect that I mean I know we still have slavery and stuff but it's hidden and it's secret because we know it's wrong so he just was truly trying to use my, my own material on me because I often say we were allowed to have our own opinion, like, you know, about spirituality or, or whatever, you know, some things, but he's just fucking flat out wrong. He just is. And that's why I'm here to show him this mirror. So we had like two fights at dinner time. So we go back to the RV and he's so mad at me for not only like the backing her up with the transgender issue, but backing her up with the food in issue but it's his birthday and he's very sentimental about such things so I'm like fuck it I'm just gonna swallow not my pride but I'll just I'll put this on pause and deal with it later because because you know he is so sentimental I want to make it a nice day for him not only that he'll hold it against me for the rest of my life about how I ruined his birthday at the beach and I'm not about to take that fault so I went over to him I started to go to him and and you know make nice and we had these sliding doors he shut them in my face so I was like uh Anyway, I'm telling too many details. I got to stop telling the details. So then a few other things happened and I went over, I tried to talk to him again. And I said, listen, before I even got a chance, because you stabbed me in the back. So I tried to explain to him again about the meal and trying to, you know, listen to her and let him know that she did okay. You know, she did eat, so don't worry. And he just wouldn't hear it and he wouldn't hear it and he wouldn't hear it. And I was just like, I'm like, I can't do this anymore. I'm like, I feel sorry for you. And I left that bed and went, there's like five beds in this place. We each had our own bed. And I went into the room that closed the doors. And I was so distraught. I just, I was like, I guess I have to just divorce this guy. I mean, I don't know what else to do. He's not listening to reason. and I can't live like this anymore. So the good part is that I really did, like I thought, go through that exorcism in that I didn't need to, um, lose my shit ever being blamed again I thought but I'm still being blamed and it still hurts me so even though I didn't go crazy it hurt me deeply I'm like and I was so frustrated at the lack of change so I'm looking I'm up all night and I wrote him a really long letter which I didn't even send but it was cathartic to me and I was looking up divorce lawyers how much it cost to get a divorce and it cost about 12 grand here in Texas so you know in the next day um, I had him come and I wanted once again to try to, you know, make peace so that if not fuck his birthday, I was done with that because I tried so many times, but my, we were here with my kids and I wanted to make it the best day for them. So before I even got a chance to talk about what I was going through, he's like, you know, I had such a big breakthrough last night. I had such an epiphany and I realized that what you were saying, I mean, I saw it through your perspective. I saw what you meant about Layla having eaten and you not trying, you know, you weren't trying to get on her good side and that that was my filter and then he went to give a long explanation about why he felt that way and how he undid that particular tangle in his brain etc cetera, etc cetera. and I'm like well isn't it interesting that we both had a shift at the same time because I decided I'm not taking your shit anymore and I'm ready to file for divorce <laughs> so you know and I don't want to leave him I want him to change and grow so now I'm thinking okay you know we just we match each other's traumas um, so I'm thinking it's going to be okay or at least better, but it didn't take long before that shit to go sour again. Before that happened though, I did have that big meditation and I believed that I had like had an upgrade because of, you know, me not losing my shit. Number one and number two, um, because I came to this decision to leave him and, or, you know, leave, not leave him, but leave a place in which I was still being traumatized, accused of things that I didn't do. To me, it's abusive. It's hurtful. He blames me, blames me, blames me. I defend, I defend, I defend. And then I get so angry and hurt that I blow up. And then I'm the crazy one. Classic gaslighting shit. So anyway, moving forward, there was another instance. 
I actually had a reading, like I said, with Eric and Heather, and I learned a lot of things. And one of the things he told me about Layla was that, did I mention she's going to have like a several year journey in and out of hospitals and stuff? Ugh, this girl's like, oh, oh God, ugh. You know, I have a little bit of distrust about messages from spirit, but I know with my own issue that it doesn't happen overnight and I'm still struggling after years myself. So it has a ring of truth to it. But he told me, and I was like, I feel so bad because I yelled at her to drink her shake. I yelled curse words at her. And he's like, well, let me remind you, I've said this to you before, but your kids chose you to be their parent for a reason. They know who you are. They know how you're going to react. So even if you do create traumas in them, they're traumas that they've chosen and they need. So you know, not that I want to create trauma, but who else is going to do it? Joe down the street that we're never even going to talk to or the people she's closest to, you know, so I'm going to fuck their shit up a little bit. At least I have the best of intentions on like, you know, my mom who just didn't give a shit. But, um, so Eric told me, well, you know what, if you need to yell, then yell, just come back at her later on with a softer approach. But if you get angry and frustrated, it's okay to yell. Um, so I thought about that and I thought about the way that I had been like trying so hard to keep calm with my husband. And I knew that, you know, that big exorcism was good for me. I knew that I recognized that, but, um, um, my kids just came home unexpectedly. Okay. So, um, okay. I guess got derailed. Hang on, hang on. So, so then I realized, and also I knew that that exorcism, I needed to yell like that. So taking that into consideration, my husband pissed me off again. And well, wait, Eric told me, I want to back up just a sec. Okay. Um, he told me, I said, am I still going to get a divorce from my husband? Am I still, you know, going to separate? He's like, nope, nope. Because your husband has come along. He has shifted enough to where that doesn't have to happen. And I was so relieved because... You know, I, I, I feel unsafe. I feel like I can't, I can't, I don't have the means to take care of myself. He takes care of my 3D world. And so, I mean, I just kind of had faith that the universe would hook me up somehow, but I didn't know how it was. And, you know, who knows, things can shift again, but for now I'm safe. And, you know, isn't that sad that, you know, I, I feel safe. That's, that's the reward I get. I feel safe. I don't, and that's good. It's good, but it's not like, I'm going to be in love and have this wonderful relationship. I'm like, I'm safe. I'm at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But, um, but I didn't tell my husband this. I didn't get a chance. And then as time went on and, and the drama we went through, I just decided to just keep this to myself. And he doesn't always believe things anyway, but he thinks that I believe them and I'm influenced by them. And I am to an extent. So... <clears throat> When my husband and I are fighting again, you know, I realized too that I can't get a divorce from him. I can't afford it. I don't have any place to go. And even if I could, I want to be here for my kids. They need me right now. They need their mama. I can't go. So I just feel trapped in my situation. Even if I want to go, I don't want to go, if that makes sense. Because I want, you know, I'm their mama. I want to be here for Lulu. Le, le, le. <clears throat> so... <clears throat> Armed with this knowledge that, you know, I'm going to be okay and also understanding that it's okay to yell and scream when you need to instead of having to be calm all the time, I found out through this next little example how it is I am to tame my emotions. I think that I have finally figured it out. He's the only one that uh, that rattles my chain anymore. You know, I got rid of all the other people in my life that pissed me the fuck off, including the twins. Because even though, you know, we weren't having like direct fights, they were representatives of the past. So I let all that shit go. I let my mom go. I let the mama representative go. The love mama go. All of these people are the fuck out. And, and um, so my husband, let's see, um, it, again, it was some bullshit kind of like blame. And I was... My daughter, she kind of tattled on him again. And so I kind of let him know, I go, you know, Layla's coming with me with this information. So my intention was to let him know and give him like an alternative um, approach to the, how he was trying to deal with it. He was trying to get her to eat. And, you know, I screamed at her and I don't care if she hates me for it. Luckily, she didn't. But if she did, that would be OK because it worked. But his methods, he was being kind of. <clears throat> he was telling her an untruth, trying to get her to eat, but she knew the truth and I knew the truth and he just sounded ignorant. She didn't buy it and she didn't eat. So it didn't work. So I'm like, so maybe you can try this approach because yours didn't work. Well, instead of listening to me that this is Layla 
Layla's coming to me with this problem, and I'm here to offer you a solution. He just blasted me that I was the bad person, and I was accusing him of doing the wrong thing. I'm like, these are her words. I don't care. I mean, I do care, but I'm like, this isn't me complaining that you've done it wrong. This is her coming to me and me passing it on to you because I'm her voice. I'm here to help them. <laughs> but he just really laid into me. So <clears throat> I went out. I was actually taking her to her birthday party. And it was kind of far away, so I just stayed in that area, and I cried, and I released, and I mourned, and I decided, I decided right then and there, I'm like, you know what, I can't divorce him, but you know what I'm going to do from now on? If he even starts to piss me off, then I'm going to grab a bag, and I'm going to go to a hotel, and I'm going to charge it on his credit card, because we have, like, separate, I can, I can use his credit card for anything I need, but for the things I want, I use my own money. And so sometimes I'm, like, on the fence, like that shitty shirt I bought, I'm like, is he going to buy it, or am I going to buy it? I'm not really sure. Anyway, I paid for it, because, you know, there's always plenty of money. I'm just cheap. But, um, so... <clears throat> So in the past, I would feel like if I'm going to leave and I'm going to get a hotel, that's on me. But now I'm like, fuck that. He's paying for it. He's the one that put me into this situation of needing to leave. So I'm going to make him pay for it. You know, it's cheaper than a divorce. So suck it, hater. That's how I felt. And that just liberated me. That was my answer. That is how I calm the fuck down. I don't actually calm the fuck down. I just remove myself from a situation before it gets the best of me. In that RV, when I said, I feel so sorry for you, I feel sad for you, that let me know that he is not going to change. I cannot change him. I've done all I can do. I give up. I'm ready to move on. I'm ready to divorce him because he's not figuring it out no matter how many times I say the same thing. And, um, ooh, and another little thing on that is that you know he did a little bullshit um, and I was just trying to show him. It's like, well, you know, I'm not trying to beat you up. It really doesn't matter in the grand scheme, but you are like miscommunicating. You're thinking one thing and saying another, then getting irritated at us because we don't hear you. And I kept trying to say it over and over. I kept repeating myself like I was a little obnoxious about it, to be honest, but he wasn't getting it. So in his mind, he's thinking, I'm just making a mountain out of a molehill, but I'm sitting here saying this is another opportunity that the universe has gifted you to learn from this little tiny molehill so that we don't have to learn from mountains like eating disorders. <clears throat> so learn it from this little thing. You know, he wasn't getting the concept of that. Back to the popsicle sticks. It's just a little thing for you to observe. So you don't have to learn from the big things. So appreciate these things and allow for me to call you out on it so you can learn because that's my job. Your job is to fix all the things that are broken in the house. The things. My job is to help facilitate healing of the people. So stop. Uh, you know, I don't pretend to know how to fix a car. So quit trying to know how to fix a personal relationship. Listen to me. It's why I'm here. It's what I do. Lots of people listen to me. Lots of people understand. I have valid things to say. Why can't you? He just couldn't. He'd always turn it around on me, say, you, you have a mental problem. You need help. It's like, no, I don't. You're not telling me anything that I know. I'm very self-aware. So fuck off with that stuff. So, um, so anyway, I did, that night I came home after being so pissed off and making my decision about the hotel room that I, I collected my stuff and I went and slept in my healing room, this room. I didn't want to be in the same bed with him. I just, I'm like, I'm done with you. And I did write him a big long letter that day and I sent it to him. And so the next day he came in, I'm getting ready to do my video with Tracy and he came in and he, and he, well, he texted me back. I'm sorry. So he came in and tried. I don't even know what he was trying to say. And I'm like, and you know what? I don't know what you're, if you get a, a typo in that text that you sent to me, but he told me that he didn't, and even though your words were messed up, I know you're, you're coming from a, you know, a good place and trying to help. So keep pulling me through that filter. I showed him a meme about, it's like, it said at the top, it said what I, me trying to explain what I do as a healer. And what it was, was a, a cartoon picture of a person that, quote, the healer pulling the client through this energetic filter and leaving behind the muck. And I'm like, that's what I'm doing. So and he really liked that. The picture really resonated with him. He understood it. So he's like, keep pulling me through that filter. And I'm like, and that's, that was the thing. And I said, I don't know what you're trying to say here, but do you have a typo that, that my words were messed up or your words are messed up? Cause you said your, which would be mine, but I didn't say anything wrong. I had a bunch of fuck bombs in there, but that's just me. And he's got to have to get over it. I don't give a fuck if he doesn't like my fuck bombs. Focus on the real issue at hand. 
that was another thing that happened in that RV because I kept telling Layla to drink her motherfucking shake and he didn't say two words when I was cussing at her because he understood that there was a bigger message behind it. So as I'm yelling at her, I'm saying, I hope daddy hears me dropping my fuck bombs at you so that next time I have an argument with him, he doesn't focus on the fuck bomb and the message behind it, just like he expects you to do right now. So that really benefited me. I'm playing both of them against each other. It's great. And I look at her and I go, you know how impossible daddy is when I tell him the truth. It's right there in front of him and he refuses to see it as he's hearing this. And she goes, yeah. I go, that's how you sound when you said I had a shake yesterday. So I go over to him and I go, you know how Layla sounds ridiculous when we she tries to tell us that she had a shake yesterday and she's not getting it through a thick head that she's, you know, she needs to eat more. Yeah. Well, that's how you sound. So I'm going back and forth with them. So it's really benefited me, even though it's made me crazy. So that morning as I'm getting ready and he's coming up with me or I'm, you know, confronting him on this little text about the words because I told him that he sounded ignorant when he was speaking to Layla, you know, when she came and tattled on him and he didn't like me calling him a name. I go, I'm not really calling you a name. I could have used the word dumbass. That would have been a name, but you were 100% ignorant when you're ignorant of the facts and you're ignorant of what's happening here. There's no other word, but ignorant. That's how you're acting. That's how you're being. That's how you sound to her is ignorant. You invalidate her, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that, but the night before Layla had sent me a text and she said, oh my, it was so funny. She dropped curse words at me for the first time. She goes, holy shit, dad just came in here believing one thing. And then I talked to him and he validated me. He understood me and he left here thinking something else. What the actual fuck? So I, I held it up to him and I said, you know what? Don't get caught on the curse words, but read the message. And he kept reading it and reading it. And he looked like angrier and angrier. And I'm like, let me read it because I don't think you're, I don't think you get it. So I read it in the context it was meant for. And I'm like, you should be very proud of yourself because whatever you went up there and said to her made a big impact. So good for you for apologizing to her. <laughs> he didn't apologize to me. And I go, for the record, you know what? There was nothing wrong with my words. I said everything right on to you. And, um, <clears throat> And that's when I told him about, I'm, miss, I'm missing a part. Oh, and I went on and on for like 20 minutes as I'm putting on my sparkles about how I've lived a lifetime of abuse and trauma and I'm done with it and fuck that, fuck that, I'm done with it. I don't have to be nice to people that are mean to me. Cause, and, I'm, and I go, and I'm done pulling you through that filter. You've had enough shifts to where you see that you have your own fucking work to do. And I'm not gonna let you traumatize me so that you can have another opportunity to learn. So next time you fuck up, I'm packing my bag and I'm leaving because I don't deserve to be, you know, abused like that anymore and he used to scoff at me when I'd say abuse Pfft, abuse because I didn't have her have a black eye and I live in a big old house he just didn't get that he was abusing me because he was so locked in his own ego he really believed his own bullshit so you know he's realizing that when he when his mother blamed him and his siblings for the dad leaving she's not taking accountability for her own actions why would a man leave his six-year-old child for laughing it's ridiculous what she needed to say was i was a real bitch to him or we had problems or whatever it was but it's not your fault she didn't do that she blamed everybody else for her problems and the dad you know he left he didn't need to i mean i get that he needed to leave the wife but he left his whole family he left his kids high and dry and my husband didn't end up seeing him again for like over 20 years so you know he has these traumas and he doesn't get it yet it's finally starting to sink in it's finally starting to sink in and um so now he sees that he is, this is a learned behavior. You blame everybody else because you didn't do anything wrong, his favorite thing to say. So <clears throat> after I just went on and on on this tirade of telling him I'm done taking your shit, I'm not pulling you through that filter anymore, et cetera. It was very cathartic for me. And I went in, that's when I did my, my video with Tracy and I was, you know, kind of down because I'm like, I don't have any fucking joy. Where's my joy? Because I have a lot of gratitude for, you know, the comforts I live in. I'm, gra I'm grateful for the relationship I have with my kids. I'm grateful for the opportunity to heal in a, in a relatively safe place. I mean, besides the abuse and trauma, you know, I don't worry about food and, you know, bills and things like that. So I am taken care of in that sense. So I have gratitude, but joy comes few and far between. Anyway, um, after I finished that video with Tracy, I came out and I saw my husband uh, at the dinner table and you can tell he had been like teary eyed. They were kind of red. And so I gave, I, and he can't, he, he can't talk when he's choked up. So I know he kept <laughs> trying to say stuff. He could just kind of squeak out a few words here and there. Like I'm, I'm seeing what you're saying. It's finally becoming clear and I'm really sorry for putting you through so much. And, you know, and I don't, you know, the best 
the best apology is changed behavior because he said sorry to me my whole life. Well, that's not true. He rarely said sorry to me. I had to like fucking bully it out of him and say, can't you just be like sorry for 1% of the argument we're having? Just 1%, even though I feel like it's the opposite. He's 99% responsible, but I just wanted him to take ownership and accountability for something. Well, he took a lot of accountability this time. And even yesterday when I got back from the mall, he told me, you know, I'm really trying to, I had negative thoughts and, and I consciously made an effort to kind of analyze them and, and see that, um, that they're not true. And I didn't really ask him because I know they had to do with me and I wasn't interested in hearing how he misinterpreted me once again, but I was very interested in learning that he's taking charge of his own healing. And I almost, in a way, in a sick fuck way, I almost welcome and look forward to the next time he pulls some shenanigans because that means I get to go stay in a hotel by myself have a little mini staycation somewhere <laughs> but um but but really at the same time I want to I want to um what's the word I want to put his money where my mouth is <laughs> I want if in other words there's no bluff to call if he fucks with me I will go he even tried to fuck with me the other day a little bit because he's trying to teach my oldest son how to drive and he goes, I was so irritated with Josh because I'd tell him one thing and he'd do another thing that happened twice. And I'm like, well, epiphany, maybe, I mean, I know I wasn't there and I'm not exactly accusing you, but maybe just maybe, um, this is another one of your lessons of miscommunicating because he, he did that. He keeps doing it over and over again. And, and my kids have heard me say to him, mark my words. This is your next opportunity to grow. This is your next challenge when you have to speak clearly and articulate exactly what you're thinking. You can't leave it up to us to decipher. They get angry at us because we don't understand. So I asked my son, I said, what happened with you and dad with like the miscommunication? And he goes, oh, I thought he meant something else. Exactly what I'm trying. And, and my husband thinks he's so clear. I said exactly what I wanted. And I'm like, well, and he got, he goes, I knew I shouldn't have told you. And I'm like, you're going right back to that defense place. You just got done promising me that you'll at least entertain my, my thoughts, my suggestions, and maybe I'm wrong, but in light of things, in light of me saying, this is going to be your next lesson. And in light of it happening again with somebody else, then, and also keep in mind that this is what I see. I see patterns. I see things from a bigger perspective. So when you have a pattern of something, it's an opportunity for you to grow. So stop shutting down and listen to me. Maybe it's nothing, but maybe it's something. So that was pretty chill, but that's the kind of thing that I'm warning him about. Don't lay your shit on me because I'm not going to take it anymore. Okay, so let me think. Um, I think I actually got it all out, and this one's shorter than the last one. Oh, but wait, did you see me be so awesome with my intro? I did it. Anyway, it's only okay. I don't love it, but by my standards and my level of skill, it's magnificent. Pat myself on the back for that one. So funny, because last week I'm like, I'm going to get rid of silver linings. I'm done. I'm going to close this door and open a new one. And now I'm creating a new intro. Huh. I don't usually flip-flop like that too often, So, but it does happen. Um, okay, I'm going to review this at some point. I hope, I hope I hope this is a good enough one. I'm always reluctant at the end of these. Hmm, hmm. I don't know. Okay, so just a quick update with Layla in case you haven't read online. Um, so far, she has, we did the assessment, the phone assessment the other day, and they are absolutely going to accept her and accept her into the program. Sounds like she's going off to college, but whatever you call it, I don't know if she's going to be, she's going to be an outpatient, which is good because the inpatient place was four hours away, but the outpatient is either going to be <laughs> partial hospitalization where she's there seven days a week, 10 hours a day, or she will just do, I can't remember how many hours. I feel like it said six hours, three times a week. I don't remember which one it is or what it is, but anyway, one of those two things is going to happen. And fortunately, like I said, you know, my husband is, he takes care of all of our um, lower heart, lower hierarchy of needs and our insurance. We have really good insurance, so we don't have to have the financial worry about it. It's fairly close to home. And so, I'm feeling, you know, some peace and some relief on that. And I guess, you know what, if I'm going to find joy in this, uh, I know we all have, you know, things that we need to learn and grow from. And this is just hers. This is just hers. So 
at the end of this very long and painful journey, I hate to sound so negative about it, but how can healing from anorexia be anything but that she will, she will find power. She will find strength in this. And one other thing about that is that she's going to meet with like minds. There's going to be other kids that are, you know, you know, equally empathic and equally, you know, in the same place. And she's going to compare this new group of kids with the friends that she hangs out with now, which I personally do not like. I feel like most of them are a bunch of fucking vampires sucking the life out of her. And I can't tell you how many times she's asking me, what do I, what do I say to my friend that wants to kill themselves? So I'm trying to counsel her. And I'm like, if you're really worried, then I'm going to call 911, you know? And she's like, no, no, it's okay. You know, she, we don't know what to do, but I'm tired of wasting my energy on this friend. There's no reciprocity between them either. So I'm really, you know, that's a silver lining right away. And this is according to Eric. That's what Eric said, that she'll find a new group of friends and be able to reevaluate and, and that she's not even, you know, the reason she's kind of glommed onto this group of friends, even though they don't quite vibrate at her same place, is that at least it's a group of friends. And, you know, when you're young, you need to belong to something. So it's either that or no group at all. And I don't know whether or not that's true, that's how she feels. So she stays with these people that she's comfortable with. But I'm very glad that she will find some some people that have like, I don't, you know, I know I'm judging them, but at least these people will have like a depth that she can relate with, uh, an experience that she can relate with and and have, you know, the reciprocation of a friendship rather than having somebody else just suck the life out of her and me. Um, let's see what else. I'm not really sure I've got anything else. Hmm. Let me see. The twins, I'm kind of at a place. Like I said, I wanted to let them go. And I, I really want to be, I really want to be Michael's friend again. I just, I miss that. I don't have to have a romance. I don't have to do any of that stuff. So I'm hoping that, that, I don't know. I don't know, but you know, hardly have any time to think about that. I just had some chance to think about it earlier today for the first time in quite some time. So that was kind of nice to remember him and not like pine away from him in that romantic way. But I, I do want, my, it's like a long lost brother in a way, you know, I miss my family. I miss my family member. So hopefully we can clear all this bullshit out and just be friends again. And it was so nice to connect with Heather. You know, we've been pulled apart. But in that meditation I did, it was her. It was her I connected with. I, I went through the whole list. Avery, Eric, Mergerlo, all, you know, whoever, whoever my favorites are. But it was Heather and Heine that I clung to and my heart just exploded for them. So it was really nice to connect with her on that reading. But almost immediately we, we split apart part again and we're just not done with our own individual journeys and that's okay. Just having the reunion of, of us was just enough to um, let me know that, that, when we finish our individual works, it's going to, we're just going to pick up right where we left off. Maybe a slight twist, maybe, you know, cause they keep saying that we'll be more like sisters than friends and, um, you know, probably both, but it, it'll just have a bigger, a greater depth, whatever. Okay. Uh, let's see anything else. Uh, work shit out with my dad, working shit out with my man, uh, my kids. Okay. My body. Uh, okay. I guess that's it for now. All right, you guys, thank you again. And gosh, you almost lost me. You almost lost silver linings to doom and gloom. I am going to end it one day. I, oh, I know why. Sorry, I'm going to go back to the twins one more time. Because I keep feeling like this show's going to go on until that, you know, that union happens. It's like I feel like I have to end this show with the ending of that story. Because I've been talking about them so long that I just feel like, this isn't going to end until that happens and I can report to you about it. Remember, I'm supposed to brag about it. But um, but I, but to me, that was still feeding it. So I was like, you know what? If I fucking cut this shit off now, then I'm not waiting for that to happen. I'm not waiting to be able to present it to you. So that was one of the motivations that made me want to just say, fuck it, I'm done. And I, I got to admit that even though it was a little bit sad, I felt relief about it. I felt relief, but I was feeling so much pressure to, to you know, make the time to do this. But, um, but at the same time, it's the only, it's the only time I get to get dolled up. And, you know, I get tired of my, my you know, frumpy mom look at the mirror. I'm not going to get dolled up to go to the grocery store. And I don't go anywhere else but meet Sarah for coffee. Which, by the way, I did it again this morning. And I just got to give her props because... <sighs> You know, we swap stories, but it's always me that goes first because I've got so much crap to unload. It's like, okay, what's next? Now what happened? So I'm like so grateful 
for that friendship to be able to unload on her like that. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah's higher self. She's a real nut. We were talking to, and when she, you know, reciprocates and tells me her story, they're mostly ridiculous synchronicities that don't even really matter in the grand scheme of things, but she just enjoys it so much that her guides just keep throwing that nonsense her way. So I get a big kick out of her stories and I'm glad for her. I'm really glad that she doesn't have to come back at me with all the same bullshit that I bring to the table. Ugh. All right, that's it. Signing off for real this time. Hope I don't come back to add something on. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm glad that I stuck around for another, another season of Silver Linings. All right, guys. Thanks. Bye.